Chapter 3, Part 2 Rule Non-Consequentialist Theories of Morality The authors of our textbook write that rule non-consequentialists believe that there are or can be rules that are the only basis for morality and consequences do not matter. The following of the rules itself is moral. Conversely, the disobeying of the moral rules would be, by definition, immoral. Throw and Kraussman conclude that non-consequentialists believe that morality cannot be applied to the consequences that ensue from following the moral rules. Now, there are a number of things in the author's explanation of rule non-consequentialism that need to be challenged. I've already talked about some of these things, but we'll talk about them again briefly here. Rule consequentialists do believe that consequences matter. They just believe that better consequences will result from obeying the rules than from disobeying the rules. Certainly, a non-consequentialist would believe that rules can be established and that these rules are moral absolute. Therefore, a person who follows the rules is moral and a person who disobeys the rule is immoral. But it doesn't follow that non-consequentialists believe that morality cannot be applied to the consequences of a person's moral choices or of a society's moral choices for that matter. Their contention is that following the rules will result in better consequences than disobeying the rules. And let me repeat that because it's important. A non-consequentialist believes that following the rules will result in better consequences than disobeying the rules. As far as anticipating the consequences of our action, a rule non-consequentialist would say no one can really do that because we don't know the future. There is that law of unexpected consequences. We've all had that experience of doing something that we thought would result in some good consequence and then having the whole thing blow up in our faces. Uh, ah, wow, we didn't expect that, but it happened anyway. And so the non-consequentialist says that human experience has taught us, and the person who holds to a divine uh, rule form of non-consequentialism would add, and our faith leads us to suppose that good consequences flow out of being a moral person and bad consequences flow out of being an immoral person. And the moral rules are not really something that need to be reinvented. We know what they are. This brings us to the divine command theory. This would be the authors of our textbook's least favorite of all moral theories. This is the theory that has served as the moral foundation for Western civilization ever since the triumph of Christianity in the fourth century. The divine command theory states that morality is based on something higher than mundane human events. Now the term mundane human events, a little bit of a loaded word there, and a little bit of a slap at the divine command theory. Uh, let's break it down this way. The divine command theory says that morality is not a human invention. Morality then is not based just on human experience and the sociological need for rules so that we can live with one another in an ethical and a meaningful way. Morality, according to the divine command theory, is based on the existence of God. Now, the author avoids that term, and he would say that the divine command theory is based on the existence of an all-good being or beings who are supernatural. I've talked about this a little bit before, but in present forms of uh, polytheism, the 
moral rules are not handed to us by the gods or by the spirits in the unseen uh, spiritual realm. They, too, are subject to the moral rules. There's only one religious system that would have uh, many, many gods, and that would be the Hindu system. Although some of the spirits, I suppose, in uh, Buddhism, would, Taoism, would be elevated to God status as well. But whatever the system is, these beings are not the source of the moral rules. They themselves are subject to them. It is only the Abrahamic religions that posit the existence of a God who is the source of the moral rules. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about God as defined by the Abrahamic religions, the creator of the universe and the source of all of its laws, natural laws and spiritual laws. The divine command theory says that God has communicated to human beings what they should and should not do morally. Uh, so God has made his moral will known to the human race. Uh, this is done in two ways. There is general revelation, and this would bring in natural law theory, the idea that God has made his moral will known to human beings in their moral nature and the law written on their hearts. Morality then has to do with following those moral rules, those things we intuitively know to be right, and avoiding those things we intuitively know to be wrong. But the divine command theory goes beyond this and suggests that God has made specific knowledge of his moral will available to humankind through what is called divine revelation. He has given us specific commands which we are to obey if we are going to have moral standing before the creator of the universe. Think here of something like the Ten Commandments. Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai. There's all sorts of things going on so that everyone at the base of that mountain knows uh, that God is present in their midst. And then Moses comes down from the mountain with two tables of stone, five laws on each table. And the human race now has specific, objective, propositional declarations of the moral will of God. This is the divine command theory. I want to address more specifically the author's assertion that those who believe in the divine command theory are unconcerned with the consequences of their moral choices and actions. And as has been stated, that's just not true. Here is a more specific way of explaining the divine command theory's position. Someone who holds to the divine command theory of morality fears the consequences of disobeying God more than the consequences of obeying him. Let me repeat that. Those who hold to the divine command theory fear the consequences of disobeying God more than the consequences of obeying him. It's a very simple logic. If you obey God, then he can be trusted to take care of the consequences. That's his department. Human responsibility is to obey God. We leave the consequences to God. Now, from our perspective, it might seem that obeying God is going to result in a bad consequence. But the believer in the divine command theory places faith in the, into the equation here. Uh, they believe not only that God has made his moral will known to the human race, but that he can then be trusted uh, to take care of that which we cannot see, uh, the future consequences of our action. And so by faith, the religious believer 
would assert that I think things are going to be better for me and for everyone concerned. And I think things are going to be better for society and everyone in society if we obey God. I think that's going to work out better in the long run than disobeying God. A very simple moral equation. And also an equation that the divine command theorist would say is confirmed by human history and by human experience. Uh, it seems that when people do the right thing, things turn out better for them than when they do the wrong thing. Uh, for example, let's take one of the commandments, thou shall not steal. The laboratory of human experience has shown us that you're probably going to have a better life if you are not a thief than you will if you are a thief. Now, you might think to yourself, if I steal this, things are going to turn out really well for me. But once you do that and you're caught, you may discover to your chagrin that uh, prison is not the consequence you were really looking for, but it is one of the consequences that uh, comes to those who decide to live their lives as thieves. The picture on your left is Dorth, a picture of Dorothy Sayers. Dorothy Sayers was an author, very well known in her day. She is one of those authors that pioneered a particular form of fiction known as the mystery story. She wrote mystery novels and was well known for this. Uh, she lived in England. Uh, she was an extremely intelligent woman. She wrote nonfiction as well as fiction. Uh, she was a Christian intellectual, and she was a member of a circle of Christian intellectuals uh, that uh, congregated at Cambridge. Her circle of friends included C.S. Lewis and the author of the Lord of the Rings stories, J.R.R. Tolkien. So she was very well connected. She was someone who advocated for the divine command theory and natural law. And in one of her non-fiction fiction books, uh, she addressed directly this question that the author has raised concerning non-consequentialism and their alleged lack of concern for the consequences of their action. And she explains things far better than I can. Uh, this is a portion of what she wrote. There is a universal moral law as distinct from moral code, which consists of certain statements of fact about the nature of man, and by behaving in conformity with which man enjoys his true freedom. This is what the Christian church calls natural law. The more closely the moral code agrees with the natural law, the more it makes for freedom in human behavior. The more widely it departs from the natural law, the more it tends to enslave mankind and produce the catastrophes called the judgment of God. The universal moral law, or natural law of humanity, is discoverable like any other law of nature by experience. It cannot be promulgated it can only be ascertained, because it is not a question of opinion, but of fact. The moral code depends for its validity upon a consensus of human opinion about what man's nature really is and what it ought to be. Divide the commandments of the natural law, and the race will perish in a few generations. Cooperate with them and the race will flourish for ages to come. That is the fact, whether we like it or not. The universe is made that way. Dorothy Sayers, The Mind of the Maker, 1941. I think you can see here that those who hold to the divine command theory and natural law, which is really, I think, a part of it, though it can be dealt with separately, People who hold to some form of the divine command theory uh, are not unconcerned with the consequences of their moral choices. Uh, Sayer here states it very strongly. If we obey the moral rules, we are going to flourish. If we disobey them, ultimately the race 
the human race is going to perish in a few generations. That's a very strong statement, and she has intended it to, to be a very strong statement. So why is the divine command theory considered a non-consequentialist theory since it is clearly concerned with consequences? Well, the reason it's considered a non-consequentialist theory is it does not believe that right or wrong are defined by the consequences of the choice. Let me repeat that. The divine command theory does not believe that right and wrong are defined or determined by the consequences of the action. Think back of uh, to uh, utilitarianism. It's a theory that said that right and wrong are determined by the consequences. So it is a consequentialist theory. The consequences will show whether a moral choice was good or bad. The divine command theory uh, rejects that. It says morality is defined by God. Morality is that behavior which is aligned to the moral will of God as revealed to us in our nature and more specifically through divine revelation. So it has to do with where morality comes from. The consequentialist would say morality is a human invention. And that being the case, all secular theories of morality, all systems that leave a supreme being out of the moral equation, are by necessity consequentialist. Because the rules were invented by human beings in response to human need and based on human experience, and therefore consequences gave birth to the rules and are the rationale behind the rules. The divine command theory would say not at all. God is moral, and therefore we, his creation, are moral too. Now this would be true, by the way, of more than just Western religion, though the Hindus, for example, would have a very different concept of God than the concept of God generally believed in in, West, in the West, uh, they would believe that Brahman, from which all things have emanated, is a moral force, if you will. And so there is morality throughout the cosmos. If you cooperate with that, it goes well for you. If not, karma comes around and, and bites you uh, from behind. As you can imagine, the authors of our textbook have some problems with the divine command theory. They criticize it sharply, more so than all any of the other moral theories we're going to be examining in this course. Uh, there's a reason for this. Uh, the divine command theory has been the foundation for morality uh, in the West ever since Christianity gained ascendancy in the fourth century. The authors are going to propose a replacement. Uh, they are going to say that the divine command theory is deficient and therefore we need something new. And they're going to be proposing their own replacement, humanitarian ethics. Now to make that case, they need to discredit the theory they're seeking to displace. And so they have some strong criticisms of the divine command theory. Let's take a look at them. They begin by asserting that the divine command theory does not provide a rational foundation for the existence of a supernatural being, and therefore not for morality either. They state this even more strongly in the textbook. They write, quote, The difficulties of the divine command theory are inherent in the lack of rational foundation for the existence of some sort of supernatural being or beings and the further lack of proof that the support of such a being or beings is enough to make rational and useful the ethical system in question." End quote. Well, this is an assertion, and many would take exception to it. 
many rational arguments have been made for the existence of a supreme being. And if you were to take uh, our course in philosophy, we have a unit on the, the philosophy of religion, and we talk about arguments for the existence of God. And a rational case can be made and has been made by many for the existence of a supernatural being. And also a, a, a case has been made for the existence of supernatural beings, not necessarily supernatural lawgivers, but of a supernatural realm, angels, demons, lesser gods, and so forth. So to say that there is no rational foundation for the existence of God is the author's opinion, uh, but it's just that. They've taken a side in this uh, debate that is going on in our time as to whether or not God, at least God in the Judeo-Christian uh, sense of that term, uh, such a creator God, uh, they say with many that there is no evidence in our mind for the existence of such a God. Well, that's fine. But there have been any number of thinkers ever bit as wise and sophisticated as the authors of our textbook who have looked at the evidence and the arguments and drawn a different conclusion. So this is what you would call an authoritative assertion and not a fact. Uh, the authors are saying we are highly educated men. We've written a textbook on ethics for heaven's sake. We are professors at a state college in California. And on the basis of our authority, we are asserting now that there is a lack of a rational foundation for the existence of some sort of supernatural being. On the other hand, you could look at someone like a Dorothy Sayer or a J.R.R. Tolkien or a C.S. Lewis. Or in more modern times, you could look at uh, someone like a Mortimer Adler, uh, someone like a William Lane Craig, uh, someone like Alistair uh, McIntyre or Alistair McGrath. Brilliant. Cambridge. Ivy League, uh, Berkeley, philosophers who have a different opinion. So be careful in your reading to distinguish between an opinion and a fact. The authors go on and say, even if we could prove that there is a God, notice they use conclusively, and we've talked about that a lot, you cannot prove anything conclusively. But they say, assuming we could, how do we prove that that morality is trustworthy? Again, we have this moral intuition. How do we know that we can trust it? Uh, you say there's a God. You say that he has made his will known to the human race in a specific, objective, propositional form through such things as the Ten Commandments, how do we know that what he says is right is really right? And how do we know that the opposite is really wrong? So this is an epistemological argument. How do we know? Sayer touched on this, but let me address this again. We've also talked about it briefly. Uh, Note the author's impossibly high standard for the existence of a supernatural being. We've talked about it repeatedly. Conclusive proof can't be done for anything. But more directly to the point he's raising, human history has provided a very large laboratory for the testing of any number of moral theories, including the author's own. And the laboratory, the author's disparage, has done quite well in the laboratory of human experience. Let's take the commandments that have to do with human interaction. Honor thy father and mother. That seems to have worked out pretty good so that the entire human race has kind of arrived at a consensus here, except for a few uh, highly educated uh, professors. Most people would agree that so long as the parent is 
acting normally from, you know, their own moral reasoning, that it's a good idea for children to obey their parents. Thou shalt not murder. Most of the human races said, yeah, that, that's a pretty good rule. Adultery? Very few cultures countenance adultery. Uh, how about thou shalt not steal? How about thou shalt not bear false witness, which has to do not just with lying, but lying in a particular context, uh, the lying in a legal uh, proceeding. Uh, most people would say, well, there is a time to tell the truth, and when someone's life and property is on the line, uh, that's a pretty good time. Coveting? Well, it's a little more hard to enforce because it's something that's on the inside. I guess we have to evaluate ourselves there. Sometimes it has a public expression in greed and avarice, and most societies have condemned that. So human experience has shown us that the standards that have been uh, either revealed to us or that have been established on the basis of our moral intuitions seem to work for human beings. So this is a pragmatic argument. Uh, you know, they work. Their opposites do not. So we can argue that for creatures such as ourselves, uh, the moral rules which seem to be uh, consensus, uh, held as a consensus among human beings and have been held as a consensus throughout human history, uh, seem to be the right kind of rules for creatures such as ours who live in social arrangements such as the ones uh, that have been created throughout the course of history. Uh, so prove conclusively, no, but we could make a pretty good pragmatic argument that these are pretty good rules. The authors also argue, well, how are we to interpret these commands? Even if we accept the existence of a supreme being and a supernatural realm, and we have these revelations of his supposed divine rule, how do we interpret them? And this is an argument, okay, let's assume that there is a God, and let's assume that he has made his moral will known to human beings. Still, we have to interpret what he has said. So the knowledge of God's moral will may be available to us, but can we ever really know it, given that we all approach this business of interpreting with all sorts of cultural biases? Well, this argument is really a straw man. How hard is it to figure out what this rule means? Thou shalt not steal. Does that really require a whole bunch of interpretation? How about, thou shall not murder? Murder being divine, defined as taking another, an innocent person's life with malice and forethought. Is that really hard to interpret? You know, the moral rules are really not that hard to interpret, and this is why throughout human history and throughout every culture, there seems to be a basic morality a basic understanding of right and wrong. As Jonathan Haidt observed, we seem to have the same pre-wiring. Now, there may be differences as to the application or the form in which the rules uh, take, given different cultural situations, but the underlying uh, uh, intuition that gives birth to the moral rules, what the divine command theorists would call natural law, uh, results in the fact that there is a, and there has been, a moral consensus among human beings throughout uh, human history. Were this not so, it would have been impossible for human beings to live together. It certainly would be impossible for there to be any negotiation 
or cross-cultural cooperation. Uh, I've had the privilege of traveling to India on separate, eight separate occasions, and I have a lot of friends in India. And the reason I'm able to have friends in India is that even though we have a different culture, and even though uh, there are differences in religion, there is still a shared humanity uh, that enables us to have social interaction. And without a consensus on basic morality, uh, this sort of social interaction and, and cross-cultural friendship would be impossible. Uh, so the interpretation of the rules is not that difficult, as some of the later philosophers we're going to be looking at who approach non-consequentialists from a non-theological perspective will point out uh, some of these moral rules are self-obvious. The authors go on to say, well, rules founded upon the divine command theory may be valid. Okay, I've listened to your argument, Professor Carlton. Hey, uh, okay, maybe they are valid. But these rules need to be justified on some other more rational base. The first question I'd say is why? You know, is there any reason why we should not accept uh, that we have been pre-wired by some, to be moral, by some divine uh, electrician? Well, there would be if you're predisposed not to believe in such a divine electrician. But that again comes down to personal opinion, doesn't it? But more seriously, who says that the commands of the divine command theory, the rules that have been established are not rational and that you cannot justify them on a more rational basis? We're going to be looking at Immanuel Kant, who believed that he accomplished that very thing. And certainly a reasonable and rational basis can be made uh, for accepting as valid the rules which are founded upon the divine command theory. We've made some of those arguments as we've critiqued the author's critique. So just because Someone says, I believe these commands have come to us from God, or I believe that God has pre-wired this moral sense in, into us. It does not necessarily follow that these rules are therefore not rational, or that these rules cannot be justified on a rational basis. Leaving divine rule non-consequentialism behind, we come now to Immanuel Kant, duty ethics. Immanuel Kant is one of the great philosophical minds, one of the most intelligent men who has ever walked the face of the earth without question. There you have his picture. Uh, he is known for what is called duty ethics. You see his dates. He waded in on a lot of important subjects. The breadth of his wisdom is staggering. Uh, he was the prototypical absent-minded professor, and he was a man so precise in his habits that it was said you could set your watch by what you saw Immanuel Kant doing every day. He left the house at the same time. He had breakfast at the same time. He went to class at the same time. Mm -hmm. He was just completely predictable in his actions. Uh, he was a thinking man, so if you saw him walking, uh, you might be amazed that he could uh, be so observant of detail in his personal life. And he was thinking all the time, so he was a little bit absent-minded. Uh, but what a thinker he was. Uh, his breadth of knowledge and his wisdom uh, stagger our imaginations even today. Now, Kant came from a very pietistic Lutheran background. He himself was a religious believer. He lived, though, in a day, a day of rationalism. And though he was very committed to the ethics he had been taught in his home as a child, particularly by his mother, who had an extraordinary influence on his young mind, 
He recognized that he was living in a day and age when he could not say you ought to hold these moral principles because God says so. He loved the morality he had been taught as a child, a divine rule, non-consequentialism, if you will. But he recognized that if these rules were going to be maintained, giving the philosophical movement away from uh, theology and towards rationalism and empiricism, that these rules would have to be defended on a ra in a rational way. Uh, you couldn't say just God said so. Because people would say, well, yeah, but are these rules reasonable? Kant believed they were, and he set out to prove it. As he looked at the human animal, Immanuel Kant came to believe that there was nothing good in us in and of itself, except what he identified as good will. Uh, human beings, like animals, have a will. But human beings have the ability, a unique ability, to follow moral rules and laws and principles, even when the following of those rules goes against our personal interests or our fear of negative consequences. Uh, we can put aside our self-interest for the sake of obeying the incessant call of morality and we can choose to follow moral rules and principles even though we might perceive the following of those rules not to be in our best interest he said that's the best thing about us we have a will to live by moral rules non-consequentialism if you will is the best thing about us now Kant argued that it is possible by reason alone to set up valid absolute moral rules. Absolutes is the big word here. And that these absolutes will have the same force as indisputable mathematical truths. You can hear an echo of Kant and what we read earlier when we talked about uh, Dorothy Sayer, uh, that you, know, you follow these rules, you get the right answer. You disobey the rules, you don't. That's just the way nature is made. So he is, uh, has a project to demonstrate that the moral rules that he has been enculturated into are reasonable, rational, that absolute morality can be established on the basis of reason. That's quite a project. Now, he asserted that these truths must be logically consistent, that they can't be contradictory. That's one thing that even the authors of our textbook will like about the old divine rule system. It was nothing if it was not logically consistent and one rule followed another. It was not a self-contradictory system. And Kant recognized that if we're going to have a system with absolute rules, they have to be those kind of rules. They ha there have to, has to be a logical consistency. and. and they can't be contradicting each other. And here was the big key for him. They must be universalizable. Now that is a word that is uh, extremely important in understanding Kant's philosophy. Uh, it can't be a rule for you and not for me. If it is an absolute rule, it has to be a rule that would apply to everyone in the world. Uh, at all times, in every situation, and in every era of human history. That's what we mean by an absolute moral rule. It would be a good rule for everyone. 
doesn't matter what the culture is. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, the period of history in which a person is living. Uh, this is a, war, a rule that would work for everyone, everywhere, anywhere, at any time. Thus, it is universalizable. On the basis of this, Immanuel Kant came up with his imperatives. The first and perhaps most important of these is the categorical imperative, because this is going to be the foundational principle for his system of duty ethics. He argued that an act is immoral if the rule that would authorize it cannot be made a rule for all human being, beings to follow. This is that principle of universalizability. So you have a moral rule and you say, for example, uh, thou shalt kill. It is okay for you to murder anyone who is inconvenient to you. Well, what would happen if that was a rule for the entire human race? Well, obviously you would have uh, chaos. Uh, you could not have civilization. You could not have interaction in any meaningful way among human beings because you never know who the next person might be who would want to kill you. Uh, kind of like a, a program that's fairly popular as I do this. I've watched it uh, several seasons myself, uh, The Walking Dead. Civilization breaks down, everyone is looking out for themselves. You never know if the next person you meet is going to be someone who's going to kill you or someone who's going to share their food with you. Obviously, allowing everyone to kill anyone they find inconvenient is not a rule that would work uh, for the entire human race. It's not universalizable, therefore it's immoral. Conversely, thou shall not murder, which by definition is the intentional taking of another human being's life, and let's add the word, an innocent human being's life, with malice and forethought. Uh, that would be a, a rule that could be universalized. When would it be appropriate to take the life of a human, an innocent human being, someone who does not deserve punishment, and you do it with malice because you hate them, and you plan it as first-degree murder. Obviously, that would be a good rule that could be universalized. It would work for the entire world. And, and so through the categorical imperative, we're able to logically see uh, that it is, uh, that a good absolute rule would be a rule against murder. It would work for everyone in the world. And the opposite would obviously be immoral. So on the basis of reason alone, we can validate all of the traditional morality that Immanuel Kant was so fond of. We can show that the uh, laws that concern human interaction and that Kant inherited from his pietistic Lutheran background are not only theologically sound, but rationally defensible. And he did this through the categorical imperative. A second imperative, the practical imperative. No human being should be thought of or used merely as a means for someone else's end. Each human being is a unique end. This is something that can be established through the categorical imperative. And the idea that, uh, you know, you let's have a law that everyone can use other human beings to accomplish their ends. Well, that could be shown to be immoral through the categorical imperative because it is not a rule that uh, can be made uh, for all human beings to follow without tragic consequences. So having established it, he makes it an absolute rule. Don't use other people. Uh, for your ends. This would take slavery off the table, for example. It would take a lot of things off the table. Each human being is a unique end unto him or herself, and therefore it is immoral to use human beings, without their consent I suppose, 
as a means to your end. This is the practical imperative. And with these, uh, Kant set forth his defense of what we would call traditional morality, showing it to be not only uh, something that religious people hold to, but something that every rational person should buy into as well. Once we have figured out what the rules are, Kant argued, we have a duty to obey the rules rather than follow our inclination to maybe not obey the rules. And we should obey the rules, the moral rules have been established reasonably, regardless of the consequence. Thus, it is a non-consequentialist moral theory. So once the rules have been discovered, you've found your absolutes. What do we do now? Well, human beings must obey them. And you do so out of a sense of duty. This is my duty not to follow the moral rules, thus duty ethics. Now, I may not be inclined in any number of situations to follow the rules. Tough. Follow the rules. Do your duty. Uh, that is the categorical imperative. That is duty. In Kant's time, and in our own time, his theory of duty ethics has been criticized. The authors of our textbook point out that although Kant showed that some rules would become logically inconsistent if you universalize them, his system does not tell us which rules are morally valid. You can universalize all sorts of things. You can certainly show that certain moral rules that we have or other cultures have would not work for a, as a rule for the entire human race because they cannot be universalized. Uh, but there are some things that can be universalized and they are not necessarily things that we want to make moral rules. For example, it, we might say that eating with your mouth closed would be a rule that could be universalized. That would be a something that you could use a categorical imperative and say this would work as a rule for everyone in the world. Is it therefore immoral uh, not to close your mouth when you eat? Uh, it, it might be disgusting, it may be rude, but is it immoral? So which of the things that can be universalized do we want to say we want to make these the moral rules of our culture and of the world for that matter? Uh, the authors point out that Kant never showed us how to resolve conflict between equally absolute rules. We've established the validity of uh, the six moral rules in the Ten Commandments. What happens when you have a conflict between those rules? For example, we have a moral rule uh, against killing. We have another moral rule against lying. Uh, we should always tell the truth. We should never murder. Okay, so the SS shows up at our doorstep. We're hiding Jews in a hidden room to keep the Nazis from killing them. Uh, a good thing, according to the categorical imperative. And the head of the SS uh, asks, are there Jews hiding in your home? If we tell the truth, it may result in the people we're hiding being killed, and we will then become accomplices in their murder. So we have a conflict between the rule that says, thou shall not murder, and the rule that says, thou shall tell the truth. How do we resolve the conflict? Uh, Kant never specifically addressed that in the categorical or the practical imperative, and he will respond to that criticism by adding another moral criteria. But at least in its initial form, he did not uh, give us any clue as to how we should resolve the conflict. And the authors point out that he did not distinguish between making an exception to a rule or qualifying a rule. And the reason for this is that Kant didn't make a distinction between making an exception or qualifying a rule. He says, logic shows you, reason shows you what the rules are. Now do your duty and obey the rules. You don't need to qualify the rules. 
Uh, there are no exceptions to an absolute rule. Do your duty. Do your duty. You will do the right thing. When you do the right thing, you'll be doing the moral thing. Kant responded to the criticisms being made of his system, particularly the one concerning conflict, by bringing in something known as the reversibility criterion. It's that idea that you were probably taught as a child. Would you want someone to do this to you? Uh, the authors refer to this as the golden rule. Technically, it's not. It's the silver rule. Because the silver rule is completely passive. I don't have to do anything except leave the other person alone, and I've, I've, I'm in good shape. The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them to do on you, and it's a little more specific. It's, it's uh, uh, not passive, it's active. It has to do with you actually doing something, whereas the silver rule has to do with you not doing something. And the silver rule is something that is contained in almost every ethical system the world has ever known, and certainly in every religious system the world has ever known. Uh, don't do something to others if you wouldn't want them to do it to you. Uh, a little child is biting. Would you want someone to bite you? Uh, then don't do it to someone else. Uh, a lot of people have suggested that Kant is sneaking the golden rule into his system. He is uh, really relying on consequences, and that would go against his system. Uh, Kant, I think, would counter that by saying, I can establish the reversibility criterion through the categorical imperative as a rule that would be a good rule for everyone in the world to follow. And as I pointed out before, it is really a bad rap to say that non-consequentialists don't care about the consequences of their action. They do. They're just concerned about different consequences than the so-called consequentialists. And so the better result of not killing is, is something that you say, well, that, that's a good result. It confirms the rule. That's implied in the categorical imperative. Why would something be a rule that would work for everyone in, in the world? Well, because the consequences of the rule would be better than the consequences of the opposite. And so it, it is really impossible to have a moral system that is not concerned with the consequences. The whole point of obeying the rules is that this is going to work out better for you if you do than if you don't. And so certainly you could say that some consequentialism is present in this moral theory, but consequences are at least implied. Good consequences are ultimately the goal of any moral system, including so-called non-consequentialism. The authors say that Kant seems to have emphasized duties over inclinations. <laughs> Definitely did. Uh, it, he stated that we must act from our sense of duty rather than from our inclinations. But he gave us no rule for what we should do when our inclinations and duties are the same. Well, he talks about that. He goes further in what he calls a kingdom of ends, and we're not going to go into that here. But a person whose inclinations are to obey the moral rules is just a person who has cultivated this wonderful human capacity to live by rules, even if those rules may seem uh, to be contrary to that person's immediate self-interest. Uh, it's nice if you have a good will. It's nice if you've cultivated character. It's a good thing if you are doing things not just because you have to, but because your character has grown to the point that you want to do those things that others might view as merely duty. For example, a person might say, well, I'm not going to kill my neighbor because it's my duty not to. Well, it might it be better to say, I'm not going to kill my neighbor because I'm not a murderer. 
That's not in my character. I'm not inclined to kill my neighbor because that which is my moral duty has now become uh, the habit of my heart. I am inclined to do my duty. We come now to Sir David Ross's prima facie duties. This picture of Sir David Ross. You can see his dates there. He passed away in 1940. He agreed with Kant that morality can be established on other bases than consequences. Uh, he agreed that the moral rules, uh, the basic moral rules that seem to be universal, uh, are uh, good rules on the face of it. Uh, but he was not as much of an absolutist as Immanuel Kant. He established what he referred to as prima facie duties. And prima facie is a term that means on the face of it. And the moral rules that Kant established reasonably, moral rules that are universally accepted throughout uh, the human race, uh, there is a general moral consensus, if not a specific one. And he says the reason this is, is it's apparent to us on the face of it that there are certain things we should do. We have a duty to do. Unlike Kant, though, he recognized that there may be situations uh, that test the rule. Uh, there may be situations in which you might have a conflict between duties. And so he addressed some of the issues that Kant did not address, and he allowed for the possibility of an unusual situation where you may need to uh, go with one moral rule, even though that would require you uh, to violate another. Going back to our illustration here, remember the underground during the Second World War, uh, you're hiding uh, Jewish refugees in your home, the SS arrives. Uh, they ask, are there Jews hiding in your home? The situation is going to demand that you violate one of your moral duties. You would decide in that situation to go with a higher prima facie duty, which is the protection of innocent life, rather than a lesser prima facie duty of telling the truth in that particular situation. Uh, some of the prima facie duties that Ross isolated were fidelity, faithfulness, reparation. You break it, you fix it. You do something wrong to someone, you pay them restitution. Gratitude, when someone does something nice for you, it's just obvious uh, that you at least say thank you. Uh, justice, beneficence self-improvement, non-malfeasance. What do you do when some of those duties that Ross isolated come in conflict with one another? Well, Ross says you always act in accord with the stronger prima facie duty, the illustration I gave. Uh, saving a life is a stronger prima facie duty than telling the truth. So if there's a conflict between the two, you go with a stronger prima facie duty. We should always act in such a way as to achieve the greatest amount of prima facie rightness over wrongness. Now here you see Ross bringing in uh, some utilitarianism. Uh, going back to that Star Trek definition, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And so the goal of morality is to act in such a way as to bring about the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And you do that when you go with the strongest prima facie duty. Uh, 
So the result of that is more righteousness is going to be done. The extreme illustration I gave you, quite obviously, if you do not tell the truth to the Nazis, more goodness on the face of it, prima facie, is going to be done through that moral choice than if you uh, chose to tell the truth in that situation and then had to live with the fact that, uh, yeah, I told the truth, but a lot of people lost their lives as a result. Criticism of Ross's theory. The author said, how are we to decide which are prima facie duties? And this would go back to Kant and, and the whole idea of prima facie is they're self-obvious. On the face of it, we know that these things are our moral duty. So how do you decide? You don't really have to sit down and decide. The idea is you know right and wrong, and there's a little bit of intuitionism here. Uh, you really have this as a moral instinct. That's why all over the world we have the same basic morality, different in its application, different in its specifics. But generally the rules are aimed at accomplishing the same purpose in every society. Well, the authors say, on what basis are we to decide which priority takes precedence over the other? Now, this is a pretty good uh, objection. Ross would answer, I believe, that it's clear on the face, face of it. It's obvious that saving a human life is a higher priority than telling the truth. Uh, we don't have to reinvent morality. We kind of know what it is. Well, the authors say, well, how can we determine when there is a sufficient reason to override a prima facie duty? Now, this is really a good one here, and, and I think uh, they nail the problem. If you leave it to me, I will always have a good rationale for breaking the rules I break. As we talked, uh, or as we discussed earlier, human beings have this wonderful ability to rationalize. And when we are violating any moral rule, we have the ability to acquit ourselves and to make a good argument that in our case, we are more than justified in breaking the rule. Okay. But how can we truly decide when the situation is serious enough that we need to override uh, the prima facie duty to honesty, to telling the truth, well, the example I gave is pretty self-obvious. But the author's point is sometimes it is not that cut and dried. I always have a reason, I suppose, to want not to do my duty. When are my reasons sufficient enough to actually not do my duty, to break the moral rule? Good question. And Ross did not answer it. He assumed there were such situations, and they are self-obvious. But I suppose all of us, in any situation, can convince ourselves that we have self-obvious reason not to obey the rules. The authors of our text make this statement. It's an interesting statement. Ross, like Kant, thought that there are rules all human beings should adhere to because it is their moral obligation to do so. But this raises the question, to whom or to what are we obligated? A divine rule or natural law theorist would argue that any other system, any system uh, that leaves a supreme being out of the moral equation is only going to hold together until people begin to ask, who says so? The who says so problem. And that's what I think uh, would be a, a good criticism of both Kant and Ross. They say we have a duty to obey the moral rules. Oh yeah? Who says so?
The authors of our textbook offer some general criticism of all non-consequentialist theories. They ask, can we avoid consequences when we are trying to set up a moral system? If we accept the author's assertion that non-consequentialists are not concerned with the consequences of their actions or their moral choices, then this would be a, an objection to the moral system that would be hard to get around. But as we have pointed out, at least divine rule non-consequentialists are concerned with the consequences of their actions. They believe that, again, better consequences will come to those individuals and societies that obey the moral rules than to those individuals or societies that disobey them. And the point of all morality is indeed consequential in a sense. We talked about this with Kant. Uh, the idea that the whole idea of morality, why should I do something right? Well, because uh, better things are going to happen to you. Greater righteousness in Ross's term are going to accumulate as a result of right actions as opposed to wrong actions. So uh, it, it is really uh, quite correct to say that you cannot set up a moral system that is not concerned with consequences. The authors ask, is it entirely possible to exclude consequences from an ethical system? No, it certainly is not. Uh, the authors go on, what is the real point of any moral system if not to do good for oneself, others, or both, if not to create a moral society in which people can create and grow peacefully with a minimum of unnecessary conflict. Exactly right. You see, the desirability of that kind of society is not the issue. The question is how best to achieve it. The non-consequentialist would say, following the moral rules that are either self obvious, those moral rules that can be rationally determined following Kant's model, those moral rules that are revealed to us in our conscience and through special revelation as is believed by the divine rule non-consequentialist, those are the rules that will produce the society the authors are talking about here. It is through following the moral rules that we create a moral society in which people can create and grow peacefully with a minimum of unnecessary conflict. If we disobey those rules, we will not have a moral society. And as Dorothy Sayer warned in a few generations we will not have a human race because the society created in opposition to those moral rules will not be a society in which people can create and grow peacefully it will be a society full of conflict and ultimately a culture that will collapse implode destroy itself. The authors ask, how do we resolve conflicts among moral rules that are equally absolute? It's a very good question. Almost every moral system has a hierarchy of rules. If you would talk to rabbis about the Ten Commandments, for example, they would explain to you that the moral rules there are given in a hierarchy. And there are sometimes conflicts among moral rules. And the resolving of those conflicts is a subject that is addressed very specifically, as we pointed out, in the Torah uh, and in the Tanakh. As the writers of the Jewish scriptures were considering uh, the laws and how they applied, uh, they had a conversation that goes on to this very day. That is the very idea behind the Talmud. 
that we are talking about the interpretation and the application of that which has been made known to us by the Almighty and how we resolve the conflicts and apply those moral, moral rules in the real world as we face any number of situations. And so this is an ongoing conversation. The conflict is, is there, uh, but because there is no immediate or easy answer to these moral dilemmas, it does not follow that we can therefore have no absolute truth in the moral realm. The authors go on to say any system that operates on the basis of such rigid absolutes as does rule non-consequentialism, i.e. divine rule non-consequentialism, closes the door on further discussion of moral quandaries. Well, as we've said, uh, there's been an ongoing conversation in the Jewish tradition. That's what the Talmud is all about. It's a conversation that has been going on for thousands of years. And those within the system look at the rules and they would say, you're, you're really kind of overstating your case when you say the absolutes are rigid. The, the rules are certainly uh, steadfast and absolute. But the application of those rules to the complexity of life, that's why we're having this conversation. That's why the Torah set up laws and an appeals process because there's a recognition that the application of absolute moral rules requires wisdom. Thus, in the Tanakh, we have the wisdom literature. Uh, so, you view our system from without, and you say, what a rigid system from within. It's never been seen as such. Rule non-consequentialism is really not as inflexible then as the authors portray it. The problem with philosophy, and this is reflected in the author's last objection, it closes the door to future, future uh, further discussion on, on moral issues. Well, actually, it doesn't. As we said, that conversation's been going on for thousands of years, but often the search for answers becomes an end in itself, and the discussion of moral quandaries becomes more interesting to the philosopher than the discovery of a solution, because if a solution is found, what do we need the philosopher for? At least that's how someone from without the system would look at the situation. The rabbis would say, if you want to talk about uh, moral quandaries, join the discussion. We've been doing it for thousands of years. You're welcome to attend. But secular philosophers, such as the authors of our textbook, would say, from our point of view, once you say you found moral absolutes, then what's there left to talk about? The absolutists would say, oh, believe me, we found plenty to talk about uh, ever since these moral truths were revealed to us.